I'll be honest. I'm not too familiar with how the final scene in my marriage played out. At the moment Candace came home from the conference, I was 30,000 feet in the air. I'd like to imagine that she walked through the door and shouted a greeting that she was home, then told me how much she missed me, and finally that she was glad to be home. She was probably hoping I would be waiting for her with dinner on the table as usual. I'd like to think she frowned when, upon entering the kitchen, she discovered a full-color printout of how she had been entertained less than 48 hours earlier by my boss, her boss, one of my close friends, and, if I'm being picky, my lawyer. When she looked under the printout, I'm sure she was upset to see divorce papers, a copy of the prenup, and a 30-day eviction notice. I'd like to think she was upset and inconsolable, but honestly, I have no idea. But then again, a little over a month ago, I had no idea that my wife was a cheating whore. And my employer, her employer, and even my friends were enjoying my wife's pleasures that were supposed to belong to me and me alone, as our wedding vows stated. My name is Thomas Other. I'm 27 years old, and I was the sole heir to a $70 million trust left by my grandparents when I turned 32. It was the reason for all the shit I'm in. Up until that point, I had reached adulthood. I was paid $8,000 a month, which was part of the interest brought in monthly by the foundation. I also had rental income from several investment properties around the country and my own luxury penthouse apartment with zero debt. But I wasn't a lazy trust fund baby. By day, I worked as an accountant at Samen & Zacks, a high-end accounting firm based in Melbourne, Australia. By now, you would guess that I grew up in a good family, and of course you would be right. However, my parents always taught me to never look down on those who don't have the same education as us. I was an only child and lost both my parents and grandparents at the same time. They were aboard a private plane that went down over Europe during their vacation when I was 21 years old. I should have been on that trip, but I had university exams, so I became the sole surviving heir to the family fortune. That I was the heir to a huge fortune was no particular secret, but I never flaunted it. My parents bought me a beautiful penthouse apartment near the university, which was just a short walk from Simon and Sachs when I graduated, so I lived very well for a few years and never complained. Back to my traitorous whore wife. I met Candace one night when my friends and I were walking around town. Candace was with a few girlfriends who were doing the same thing. We danced, I bought a few drinks, and she came back to my apartment and got into bed with me when after a drunken binge, we realized we liked each other. Ironically, Candace that night was supporting one of her friends who found out her boyfriend was cheating on her. Over the next few months, Candace and I dated several times. When we decided to become exclusive, it was a foregone conclusion. I truly believe that in those early days, the fact that I had money never bothered Candace. Until recently, I'd always thought of her as balanced. Candace worked for one of the top marketing firms in town and was making a decent salary herself. Looking back, I thought we had a wonderful married life. Being a young and well-to-do couple, we rarely ate at home. On Tuesdays and Thursdays, we both worked out at the gym, and on Saturdays, we partied in the city, enjoying gourmet meals, dancing at clubs, or laughing heartily at one of the local comedy clubs. Remembering how I had asked her to marry me, I shuddered at what I now knew. Of course she said yes, and at the time I considered myself the luckiest man in the world. Candace's looks were what most men would consider quite average. We had been married for two years and had started talking about a family when, in retrospect, things started to fall apart. Every few months Candace had to leave for work, a conference, or some other reason. I didn't think much of it at first. After all, we never have any reason to doubt those we love, do we? More than once, while my wife was away, I would relieve the stress of watching one of our home movies. But I never thought about the shit show that awaited me until one day it happened. My manager and partner at the firm I worked for, George Seaman, had just announced that he had to go away on a business trip for three weeks. This happened from time to time, but the duration of three weeks caught my attention. Candace also informed me this morning that she was to attend a three-week conference next week. Of course, being the clueless husband that I am, I thought it was more idle curiosity than anything else. But it was one of our interns, 22-year-old blonde bombshell Iona from Germany, who brought me up to speed. Hi, Thomas, Iona said, entering my office after George's announcement. Do you have a minute? Sure, Iona, give me a second, I told her, saving a spreadsheet I was working on for one of our corporate clients. I turned to her and studied her for a while. Iona Brown was short in stature, but very pretty. She had long golden hair down to her waist, 
big expressive blue eyes and the miniaturization of a princess. She always wore conservative clothes but in a very professional manner that always said she was serious about her work. At the end of the next week, she would finish her work with us and move north, where she would tour Australia for the next year and then travel to Germany for another year to meet relatives. In the three months she worked for us, I had a few cups of coffee with her. She struck me as honest to a fault and never let anyone do wrong. One day, one of the junior accountants was under pressure to get a job done and tried to cut a few corners. Even though Iona was only a trainee, she told all and the accountant had to eat crow for a month. So when I looked at Iona and saw the solemn expression on her pretty face, I frowned, knowing the topic was going to be grim. What's wrong, Iona? You look serious. Is everything okay? I asked. She hesitated for a second, looking over her shoulder at everyone who was leaving the office. Then she frowned and looked at me again. Thomas, Iona said very seriously. I need to talk to you about something, but not here. Will you take me to lunch today? I was curious as to what it might be. No problem. Do you think DIY is good? I asked, referring to the DIY sandwich store that was quite popular. For a few dollars, you could make a sandwich, wrap, or salad with anything you wanted. She nodded. Yes, but please, the one on George, on the other side of William Street. Admittedly, I was curious, but I didn't think about traveling that far from the office until we were seated at the food table and she reached out for my hand. I looked at her, raising an eyebrow. I never thought Iona would hit on me, and she knew there was no way I would cheat on Candace. Seeing my raised eyebrow, Iona quickly removed her hand, blushing. I'm sorry, Thomas, she said in her sweet, high-pitched tone. She had a slight German accent. It's just that I know what I have to say will be very hard for you to hear. I wasn't thinking, I'm sorry. I felt my stomach clench. I didn't know what this was about, but I suddenly realized that this was going to get me in trouble. I'd only met a look like Jonah's once in my life. It was when my grandparents and parents hadn't returned from overseas. I swallowed. It's okay, Jonah, I replied with mock confidence, forgetting about my lunch on the table in front of me. But I have to admit, I'm worried about you. What's the matter? Over the next 20 minutes, Iona told me how she had overheard George Simon talking to someone last week about how he couldn't wait to entertain everyone in two weeks. Iona blushed as she told me that he had agreed to meet with a group called Everyone for Coffee. She then stunned me by telling me that she had quietly followed him around taking pictures of George and the other men hugging and kissing the mystery woman. Turning the phone around with a pained expression on her face, Iona showed me the photo, which turned out to be of the woman, my wife, Candace. I nearly lost my unfinished lunch, and over the next few minutes, Iona told me how sorry she was. The only reason she recognized who the woman was was because of the picture on my desk of Candace and I hugging each other on our wedding day. To say I was devastated is an understatement. I must have sat there almost comatose for several minutes before Iona reached out and touched my arm again. Thomas, she said quietly, can you hear me? I snorted. Yeah, sorry, Iona. Thanks for not asking if I'm okay, but I'm not, I replied, and then sighed, wiggling my shoulders expressively. I guess I should call a lawyer. Iona frowned. I wouldn't, she said. I looked at her. Why not? You always need a lawyer in a divorce. Why don't I start with one? Iona fiddled with her phone for a minute and then turned it around and showed me another picture of the all-girl band. Because next week your lawyer is going with Mr. Simon and your wife. I overheard, there are five of them. I'm sorry, Thomas. I groaned, leaning back in my chair. My chest felt tight. A sense of panic was building in my chest, which I tried my best to keep contained. I looked at Jonah. Why? I asked the question, even though I knew she wouldn't be able to answer it. From what I understand, it's because of the money, she said. Money? I asked quietly. Yes, she replied, not quite sure how to inform me of these heartbreaking facts. I don't know what they mean by that, but they said something about how the money should stay where it belongs and that this is their way of doing it. You know, there are those moments when you have a light bulb go off or you think, what the heck? Well, I had both at the same time. Iona, I need to throw up, I said suddenly. She nodded. I understand. I shook my head, 
my jaw now set in determination, despite the raging war of emotions playing out beneath the surface. No, I mean, I need to make myself vomit and send you back to the office, telling everyone I'm not well. Make sure Mary calls Candace and tells her I'm sick. Tell her I'm on my way to the doctor, and I'll figure something out after the visit. Mary was our office manager and served as our assistant bookkeeper. I stood up abruptly. Iona stood up with me. Iona, I can't thank you enough for what you did, I told her, giving her a strained smile. If you hadn't told me, I might have found myself in a situation that I think might be unwinnable. Can you tell this story to Mary? Will you be able to keep it between us? Without a second's hesitation, Iona nodded her head, swearing quietly in German. Of course. I'm sorry, Thomas. I hope you won't hold a grudge against me. I smiled and held out my hand. No, just the opposite. I owe you a great debt of gratitude. If you need a favor in the future, give me a call. Today you have gained a friend for life. She smiled back. We shook hands and went our separate ways. I walked into the public restroom and tickled my tonsils, forcing myself to vomit. If I was going to take action, I had to do it realistically. I called my doctor, but hung up at the last minute while I was being restrained. I wasn't sure who was involved in this affair. I called another doctor and made my next appointment. I caught an Uber to get to the doctor and was seen just five minutes after my appointment time. The doctor, an Indian woman in her 40s, examined me, told me I most likely had a stomach ailment, prescribed some mild antibiotics, and gave me a prescription and a three-day sick leave. Coming out of the operating room, I decided I needed to do something about it. I took my car and drove to a small hotel on the outskirts of town where I had always wanted to stay. It was a 15-minute walk from home, so I had never had to use it, but today it would be quite suitable for my purposes. I walked through the door and checked in. A few minutes after I laid down on the bed in my room, the phone rang. It was Candace. Are you okay, babe? She asked with a note of concern in her voice. Mary called and said you weren't feeling well. Yeah, I'm fine, I replied, faking it like I usually did when I was sick. I had just come from the doctor, and she said I probably had a stomach ailment. I've settled in one place for a few days, so I won't pass it on to you before you leave for the conference. On the phone, I felt her frown and hesitate briefly. I understand. Is there anything I can bring you? I was surprised. For a woman who'd slept with my boss and who knows who else, she showed great concern. I thought about it for a moment. Yeah, could you bring me a couple sets of clothes and toiletries? If I'm stuck here for a few days, I might as well get comfortable. You can take them to reception, and they'll leave them at my door. I told them I wasn't feeling well, and they'll bring me chicken soup for dinner. Oh, baby, Candace cooed. I wish I hadn't left so I could keep an eye on you. I fake coughed. It's okay, Candace. I'll be better in a few days. We talked for a few more minutes, and I never would have believed anything was wrong if Iona hadn't shown me a picture of Candace and George in an embrace. As we hung up, I wondered if there was no other explanation. I had my laptop with me in my satchel, so I pulled it out, connected to the Wi-Fi in the guest house, and started searching for private investigators. I talked to three different agencies until I found someone willing to meet with me in the morning. I also called a new law firm, Bradman, Torrance, and Clark. I knew they were my attorney's main competitor and scheduled an appointment two hours late to meet with the investigator. That night I tossed and turned, slept for half an hour, and then woke up to tossing and turning again. I was dozing off again when Candace called, checking to see how I was feeling and if I had gotten my clothes. There was concern in her voice and I wondered again if she had really left me. Iona wouldn't lie. The pictures she'd shown me certainly didn't. But I thought that maybe she had a doppelganger that George Simon was sleeping with. In the morning, I informed the front desk of the B&B that I was leaving and would be back later today. I let them know I was on my way to a doctor's appointment in case my wife called and caught a car across town to get to Discreet Investigators, a private investigation firm. Inside, I didn't have to wait long as a very unassuming man came out and ushered me into a quiet office. I was surprised when he checked me for electronic bugs and made sure no one was eavesdropping. He made me tell my story. The guy, that's what he called me, nodded when I told him what Iona had shared with me, showed him the pictures, and then asked what I wanted. Mr. Other, we can offer a number of different services, but can you tell me what you need? Asked Norm. I thought for a moment. I would like my wife and my boss to be monitored, pictures, videos, and anything else you see fit. 
If something is going on, I want to make sure I know what it is before I take any action. I hesitated, and Norm noticed it right away. I? he asked, raising an eyebrow. I looked at the guy and decided to reassure myself. Look, I'm not sure I know what's going on, but my source says money is mentioned between my wife and my boss. I'm going to inherit a large trust fund in a few years, and I can't help but speculate if it has something to do with that. I need to know if I can trust you if you know there's a decent amount of money involved. Norm looked back at me for a moment, then smiled. Give me a minute, Mr. Other. He went out and returned a few minutes later with a pile of forms. I think we can help you get everything you want, Mr. Other. These forms are our confidentiality and financial forms. Our rates and legal terms are outlined here. I scanned the documents, noting that they were using the same lawyers I was about to visit. I signed the forms and we shook hands. Norm told me that he would have people for both Candace and George by the end of the day. I informed him that I would cover all expenses, including travel if necessary, and headed off to my next meeting with the people who could be my new attorneys. Randwick Johnston had been our family attorney for many years. His grandfather had worked with my grandparents and parents when the trust was created. When his grandfather retired, Randwick, or Randy as we called him, took his place. In the year since my family passed away, I never had any reason to doubt his integrity. I understood that handling my accounts was a feather in his cap of sorts. In fact, I had made recommendations to him several times over the years, and consequently, he had a small practice with several people at the firm. However, after yesterday's revelations, I wasn't going to wait for the mountain to fall on me. I was going to trigger the avalanche myself and hopefully not get caught up in its destruction. That's why Damien Torrance of Bradman, Torrance and Clark, ushered me into his office within two minutes of my arrival. Damien had been trying to get my business for years. A few years ago, Randy needed an extra pair of hands to help with an investment I wanted to make, and Damien had expressed interest, even offering to bring Randy in as a partner when he found out the details. So, Mr. Other, to what do we owe this rather unexpected visit and Mr. Johnston's absence? asked Damien, with that questioning look that only lawyers get. I have reason to believe that my wife, my boss, and my lawyer are conspiring against me, and I need to defend myself, I replied, with a slight hint of concern in my voice. Lawyers are often portrayed as heartless and unfeeling bastards who run up huge bills and don't care about the people they represent. Damien Torrance was the epitome of this culture. He wore an expensive three-piece suit and sat in a lavish office designed to inspire fear. After hearing my statement, Damien stood up and turned to look out over the impressive view of Melbourne behind him. I heard him exhale and for the next 20 minutes I told my story leading up to this encounter. You like a challenge, don't you, Mr. Other? He said, turning to me with a sharp grin on his face. Look, he said, spreading his hands. If you agree to turn your business over to our firm regardless of the outcome of the case with Mr. Johnston, I'll give you a total discount of 25% off our services for the next three years and even add a hundred of my billable hours for free to seal the deal. I stared at Damien for a minute, studying him. Why? I asked. Thomas, may I call you Thomas? I nodded. He nodded back and sat back down. Keeping your account means a lot to us. It's not just the amount of money in your trust. It's also the business it brings in. You manage your money wisely, choose good investments, and I know that if I get your business, we'll have some more big clients coming in. If I give you an incentive to switch to us now while you're in trouble, it'll stop you from running around shopping and give us both a long-term benefit. I laughed. This guy was a great white shark, but he knew how to sell it. We spent the next hour ironing out the details, and then he asked his assistant to take me to another room where I signed the contract to end my life in triplicate. Admittedly, they brewed great coffee here and brought me lunch for free. As I was finishing filling out the forms, Damien looked over to me, smiling. Thomas, just want to let you know that Norm from Discreet Investigation just contacted us, and I let him know for you to call him back and confirm that we are now representing you. Thought you might want Norm to follow up with Mr. Johnston as well? I thought for a moment and nodded. Good idea! And Thomas? He said it with a serious expression on his face, but it looked a lot less professional. Yes? Would you mind having brunch on Sunday morning? I mean, it's not like you want to do much in your usual circle until it's over. I thought about it for a bit and agreed. I spent the rest of the day at the Nokleshka and started going through our bills. 
there was nothing unusual on any of them. However, no longer being the gullible person I had been 24 hours earlier, I set up a couple alerts in case something happened to the amount above $1,000 a day. That night, I received an email from George asking me to get well soon and hoping I would be back in the office on Monday. Candace called me and lovingly told me how much she missed me. I knew that if none of this was true, then I had a lot to make up for. But what kept me wondering was that Candace had never once said she was considering canceling the trip and staying to watch over me. I got a call from Norm. He confirmed that he had followed up with all three targets, and now all that was left to do was wait. In his experience, if a deceiver had a scheme emerging, he didn't change it unless necessary. Otherwise, it was harder to maintain the lie. As a result, he didn't wait for anything until after they left for the conference if they were really going to meet. Finally, I got a text from Jonah asking how I was doing. I replied that I was doing well, but I was nervous to confirm what was really going on. By Saturday afternoon, my worst fears were realized. The conference, if you can call it that, was being held at a hotel a few hours' drive from Melbourne. The five of them had rented a room and didn't even bother to close the curtains before beginning their debauched orgy. Norm's three investigators met their tails and each found their own place to watch what was going on. Within an hour, Candace was already being entertained. Sunday morning, just a couple days after their so-called conference began, I woke up and checked out of the hotel. I wasn't feeling well from what I had been told so far, but I needed to head home to change and head over to Damien's for brunch as we had agreed. As I entered my apartment, I looked around in dismay. Everywhere I looked, I saw places where Candace and I had made love. But now I also saw each of her other lovers entertaining her in the places they sat when they came to visit us. I threw up again, this time in the bathroom before I quickly showered and changed. I knew I would never stay in that place again. Candace had defiled my home, whether she entertained them here or not. An hour later, an Uber dropped me off at Damien's penthouse in downtown Melbourne. It was a beautiful apartment, and I met his wife Mel and daughter Colleen. For the next hour, the three of them entertained me. I was surprised that there was a sense of sophistication in Colleen, but at the same time a modesty that I had not expected from the daughter of a shark. After we ate a great brunch of potato hash browns with bacon and spinach and drank another amazing coffee, Colleen bowed out and left Damien, Mel, and me to chat. I looked over at Damien. The man standing in front of me in jeans and a t-shirt was the polar opposite of the take-no-prisoners lawyer I'd met a few days ago. He noticed this and laughed when I told him my thoughts. Thomas, it's okay, he said, repeating one of my favorite phrases. At work, I have to be that kind of person. I mean, I have my name hanging on the door, but after hearing your story, my invitation was an honest expression of potential friendship. I believe you are a good person who has had a lot of people fall on you from a great height. When I told Mel what was going on, she almost insisted that you come. The pair exchanged quick glances and Mel nodded. You see... Mel has been where you are now once before. I looked at the beautiful raven-haired woman again. She nodded and put her hand on her husband's arm. Damien placed his hand over hers in a very gentle gesture and encouraged her to speak. Thomas, I understand what you're going through, Mel began. Something similar happened to me a few years ago. My first husband, Lawrence, cheated on me with two other people, she said, blushing. I saw Damien squeeze her hand. She sighed. I hope everything is okay, she asked, looking at me. But Damien only shared a small part of what you're going through. He said the reports were graphic? I nodded. Well, I understand that. When I found my first husband, Lawrence, I found him in our bed with two other men. Oh, I said. Oh, I repeated, wrinkling my nose. She nodded. I'm so sorry, I said, machine whispered mentally returning to the images of my wife with four other men. I shuddered again. It was soul-destroying at the time. I was going crazy, she told me, somewhat confused by old memories. In a rage, I must have trashed half the house and then kicked all three of them out, still screaming hysterically. I ended up going to Damien's law firm to get a divorce, and one of Damien's alumni handled the case. Is that how you two met? I asked. They both shook their heads. Damien smiled, looking at his wife. My story is a little different, he told me. I was engaged, but Cherry, to whom I was engaged, couldn't stand the long and obscure hours I spent as a partner in a law firm. 
So we broke up. Not the worst breakup, but a breakup nonetheless. About a month before Mel's divorce was finalized, we met at a coffee shop downstairs. I was attracted to her face and her pregnant belly. You mean? I asked, looking at Mel, who blushed. They both nodded at me. Yes, Colleen is Lawrence's daughter, Mel explained. I found out a few weeks after everything happened. It didn't change anything for me, Damien said. I didn't hesitate to adopt Colleen when she turned two, and Mel and I got married. Lawrence happily signed the adoption papers because it meant he didn't have to pay child support. We sat for a while, letting me digest what was said. I looked at them again, sipping my coffee. So what happened to Lawrence, I asked. Damien snorted. Over the course of the following year, he became seriously ill with several STDs. We haven't followed up on him in a while, but the last we heard was that he was living in a shared house while working in customer service for a major telecommunications company. He then sighed. But if that makes him happy, then good for him. But he should have been honest with Mel. Mel squeezed his hand again and looked at him lovingly. Yes, but it brought you and me together. I can't complain about that, even if it cost me a little pain, Mel said. There is that, Damien replied almost guardedly. We talked some more and Colleen came back and spent some time with us, then went back inside to call her friends in Discord. What about you, Thomas? asked Mel after bringing each of us fresh coffee. Mel, I learned, made excellent coffee. She had taken a barista course a few years ago and really knew how to make a cappuccino. I looked at Damien and raised an eyebrow. He smiled, waving his hand dismissively. You're not on the clock, he told me, smiling. It's just new friends showing concern for someone they want to support. I smiled, which felt like the first genuine smile I'd had since everything had happened. Honestly, I looked into my coffee as if they were tea leaves that could give me direction for the future. I don't. I suppose Damien told you I'd inherit a lot of money in a few years. Mel shook her head and smiled. No, he just told me that you were in a bad position, and a little about your wife cheating on you with a few people. I looked at Damien and he smiled. The look on his face let me know that I should tell my story. Well, I said, taking a deep breath. Candace and I have been married for a few years now. We talked about starting a family soon, but then one of the interns where I work brought it to my attention that my wife was cheating on me. Turns out it was with my boss, her boss, my former lawyer, Damien smiled. And with a friend of mine. Candace has been going to these conferences for a few years now, so I can only guess it's been going on for as long as that. What I've seen from reports, videos, and photos suggests that at least matches your ex-husband. I blushed slightly at that admission. So I guess the first thing I need to do is get the house in order. They all have to go. For a moment, I saw the expression of a white dog scoping out its prey reappear on Damien's face. He saw that I caught that expression, and this time he blushed. I paused. It's okay, Damien. You can enjoy the challenge, I told him. He laughed. I sighed again shifting my gaze from my coffee to the couple in front of me and then to the balcony to look out over Melbourne. The city was quiet on the weekend and I felt peaceful. I think the first thing I need to do is get a full report from Norm, Damien nodded in agreement. Then I'll enforce the marriage contract with Candace in full and sue everyone involved. Damien laughed, but Mel frowned. Thomas, she said, leaning forward, I understand that you need to do these things, but what about you personally? You said you had money, so if this group of people betrayed you, your money must have something to do with it. But from what I'm hearing, your situation is much worse than my ex-husband's. You've been betrayed by everyone. I've been struggling with feelings of inferiority for some time, and from what you've told me, I'm sure things will be much worse for you. She paused for a moment and looked at me, her eyes soft and caring. I'm sorry, it probably hasn't gotten to you yet, she told me. It took me a few weeks, but you're going to need help. Support and a psychiatrist, Mel told me, not holding back. I shrugged. I guess, I said, and turned to look at the cityscape again. I'm serious, Thomas, she said. If you'll let me, I'd like Damien and I to be by your side. Damien is a shark at work, I smiled, still looking at the city. But I can tell you that he's very selective about the people we socialize with. The fact that you're here with us this morning shows that my husband thinks a lot of you. 
I turned around to the couple with surprise written all over my face. Damien blushed slightly and shrugged. I don't make friends easily, he told me. You're like me in that you're a man of means. Know your business and don't put up with nonsense. He looked at his wife. When you told me your story, I thought about what Mel had been through and decided that we could at least be an umbrella for him. I was touched. I never thought this guy could have a softer side or that a lawyer would care. We spent the next couple hours having a more candid conversation about my situation. Mel kept mentioning the emotional impact, and by the time I left to check into a new hotel in another part of town, I was feeling much more emotional about what I was going through. But I also realized for the first time that I had support. I talked to Candace for a few minutes when she called later that evening. She spoke to me normally again, as if nothing had happened. When I got the report from Norm during this time, I was able to time match her phone call with the video of her with Randy. Damien advised me to keep going to the office and act as normal as possible until he had as many legal documents prepared as possible. I tried, but I think everyone realized something was wrong. It was probably late Tuesday morning when Iona came in and sat on my desk. She looked at me. Thomas, you look terrible. So you found out something happened? She asked questioningly but quietly, trying not to speak too loudly. I nodded slowly. Judging by your mood, it's a lot worse than we talked about, she said as if she expected it. I nodded again. I leaned back in my chair, trying not to snap. I'm sorry, Thomas, I really am, she said sympathetically. I'm sorry I'm the one who told you I'm ashamed. In her German accent, the word ashamed sounded much more mournful than in her Australian accent. I looked at her again. Don't be, I told her. Feeling my resolve grow to fight my way out of this situation as I watched her try to understand my pain. If it weren't for you, I'd still be an ignorant cuckold walking toward an unknown future. What's a cuckold? she asked. I found a simple definition on Wikipedia and saw her eyes widen with shock and then soften with sympathy. Then in low tones I gave her a summary of what I had learned, being careful not to describe in too much detail the sordid scenes I had seen. Without even listening to the whole, by the end of it, tears came to her eyes. It was a good thing I had an office, because if we had been sitting on the main floor, we would have been stared at even more than we were now. I wondered, not for the first time, if anyone here knew that William Zacks, the second owner of Salmon and Zacks, knew about the affair. Iona asked if she and I would meet her for dinner that night, because she wouldn't be able to keep her cool if I invited her to dinner and told her everything. I agreed and we hit the road a few hours after work. She had four days, including today, left before her paid internship ended, so she wanted to leave well. I will admit that later that afternoon, our office manager, Mary, looked at me strangely as I passed her in the hallway. After lunch, she conferred with William for several hours, and I pretended to work the rest of the day. I looked at both men. I had talked to Damien, who had become my new lawyer and new friend, several times this week. I'd even talked to Mel a couple times. I quickly began to trust this man. Of course, Damien is part of the inner circle, I told my private investigator. What's going on? What have you heard that makes this worse than what we've seen so far? Norm looked me straight in the face as he uttered the next phrase that had nearly knocked me out of the loop in a week of confusion. They're talking about being able to kill you in about three years. What? Damien and I said at the same time. Norm nodded. Not right away. However, twice now we've overheard the group talking about taking you out in a couple years and dividing your trust among the five of them. I sat there, stunned. Then looked at my investigator. How? They don't have a method yet, Norm told us as if he was breaking the news. But they've been talking about an accident, which they don't like very much. They're leaning toward the possibility that your wife slowly poisoned you by putting something in your food. Stunned was the wrong word. Shocked was closer to the truth. The only good news is that they're talking in the future tense. They don't have an actual plan yet, but apparently they talk about it every time. Your friend Roger is apparently a chemist. I nodded my head. And he said he can make a compound that will slowly kill you. I... I... Sorry, guys, but I... I couldn't finish. Both men nodded in agreement. Your wife, for her part, seems somewhat reluctant. I certainly believe that she cares for you, 
but she seems willing to go out of her way to get some of your money directly. But why? I whined more than I wanted to. We're married, and if the money belonged to me, it would belong to us. Why is she trying to do this? She knows I would never limit it. Norm shrugged. People do stupid things when it comes to money. Look, the main thing is that they haven't done anything yet. I believe they want your wife to have the baby and are waiting until you have full access to the trust to smooth things over. My team is still in place, Norm told us. They are still listening and frankly they are as concerned as you are probably feeling right now. All three of them sought counseling after this assignment and they are all seasoned professionals. We discussed a few more details and Norm pulled out a USB drive for Damien and me with other videos, photos, and audio recordings. Damien told me that next week he would prepare all the necessary paperwork, including the divorce papers using a copy of the prenuptial agreement. Next week I will sue Simon and Zach's, Candace's place of employment, and every cheater. He even talked to a real estate agent who wasn't averse to selling the condo. He believed that once I gave the okay, the condo could be sold very quickly. After their plans to kill me in the future became known, Damien also mentioned that he would talk to the police about a plot to commit murder. He prepared restraining orders for each of them that they were to stay as far away from me as possible. Later that evening, I had dinner with Jonah and told her pretty much everything. She was appalled at the way I was being treated and asked what I was going to do. I tried to keep quiet, but she also knew me well enough to realize that I wouldn't tolerate Candace or the other four treating me so badly. The next few days went by as normal. Well, as normal as is even possible when your life is turned inside out. I worked, ate, seemed to sleep, and every night I changed the lodge I was staying at. Now I was getting a little paranoid that someone might know where I was lying. Norm called me Thursday afternoon and asked me to meet him in the evening. When I arrived, I was surprised to find Damien already there, a grim expression frozen on his face. As the three of us sat down at the table and I looked at the two men, my heart dropped. Is it really that bad? I asked, trying to be cheerful, but my heart was out of place. Norm nodded. I invited Damien here because it became known that you weren't doing a good job, it got to your boss, and he talked to your wife. Our team managed to get some audio recordings using a special microphone. My heart clenched. Thinking back over the last few days, I realized that both William and Mary had been aware of what was going on and talking to George to some degree. If I thought that was the end of it, I was wrong. Norm cleared his throat and brought my attention back to the current moment. I'm sorry, but this is worse than anything you've seen so far. You mean my wife having fun with my boss, her boss, my lawyer, my friend, and at least a few other people at my workplace, and that's worse? I asked, with a note of contempt in my voice. Norm didn't take it personally. He nodded. Unfortunately, he began, but stopped. I invited Damien here today because he is acting as your new attorney. So far, I've only shared snippets with him as he set things up. But given what today's report showed, I think he should be aware of our next steps. In the end, I settled on a plan that would keep them in the dark as long as possible, giving me enough time to get out of the first trouble. True, it meant I'd have to hold out on work for the rest of the week. After that, however, all hell would break loose and I would never set foot in that place again. We spent some more time planning, and during our conversation, I even got a call from Candace. I sent the phone to voicemail saying I'd call her back later to keep up appearances. The next day, we threw a farewell party at work for Iona. She had successfully completed her internship and was looking forward to her next step north. Over cake and coffee, she quietly asked how I was feeling and I shook my head. She asked if we could meet for a drink after work and I smiled. The rest of the day, I trained hard and managed to get some work done. By the end of the day, I got a few smiles from William and Mary as I turned in my work and seemed to be back on track. That evening over drinks, without revealing details, I told Iona that things were getting worse and that it was a good thing she wouldn't be working at Simon and Zach's for long. She understood the hidden meaning, and while we were talking, I got a call from Mel. Hey Thomas, how's it going? She asked with concern in her voice. On second thought, I'm fine, I told her while Iona looked at me, perplexed as to who I was talking to. I have a plan, and your husband is frothing at the mouth waiting for it to start. Mel's laughter could be heard on the other end of the line, and Iona looked at me perplexed. Listen, I was calling about Damien and I planning to go penguin watching tomorrow near Phillip Island, and I was wondering if you wanted to come with us. 
Before you say no, I want to tell you that you should go because you need to get out in nature and be with friends who can help you get through this. I smiled and then looked at Jonah who was waiting patiently for me. Sure, Mel. Do you mind if I bring a friend with me? I asked. Iona looked at me. I heard Mel laugh. Sure. What's her name? You could hear the mirth in her voice. Iona, she's the one who brought me up to speed. We talked for another minute and agreed on a time and place to meet. When I hung up, Iona continued to look at me questioningly. Did you just ask me out by proxy by calling another woman? She asked. When she said it, I think she saw the panic on my face. Her face changed and she laughed. Relax, Thomas, Iona told me, putting her hand on my arm. I realize you need friends right now. Where are we going? And have I heard the word penguins? The next morning at 7.30, Jonah and I met Damien, Mel, and Colleen at a gas station outside of town. I was surprised when they showed up in a canary yellow 2019 Mustang. I heard the sound of the big V8 before I even saw it and was impressed, then surprised when it pulled up next to my own 2020 V8 Mac 1 Gray. I knew I liked you for a reason, I smiled as I greeted Damien. Mel and Jonah smiled as Damien and I spent the next few minutes talking about Mustangs until we realized we hadn't introduced the ladies to each other. Excuse me, Damien, Mel, Colleen, this is Iona. Jonah, this is Damien, Mel, and Colleen. Damien is my new attorney. They shook hands, Mel hugged Jonah, and we hit the road. Have you ever wondered what could sound better than a big block V8 coming off the highway? Well, that's two big blocks heading in the same direction and having a great time. By the time we got to Phillip Island, I was smiling the full width of my face. Damien was a cocky racer, and his self-taught lawyer wanted to play. So we did. Jonah, for her part, was having a lot of fun, too. We chatted along the way, belting out the lyrics to the song Black Betty, remade by Spiderbait. Throughout the day, we had a great time with the penguins. We've all visited them before, but let's face it, penguins are cute whenever you see them. We had a great lunch of fish and chips sitting on the rocks, and it made me feel good to know that I had friends who had my back. It also surprised me that towards the end of the day, Jonah took my hand in hers. It felt natural, like it was meant to be. I must have blushed a few times when she looked at me. I was still married, and even though my wife was betraying me, I told myself I was still married, and fidelity meant a lot to me. About half an hour before we headed back, Colleen talked Jonah and Damien into walking with her to the penguins, and I could smell the setup as Mel and I walked behind them. She likes you, you know? she said as we walked behind the other three. I nodded. I know, I kind of like her too, but... Mel put her hand on my arm as we walked. I know, Thomas. She knows too. Jonah and I talked about it earlier. She was originally going to go to Queensland for a month before looking for her next job, but she said she wanted to wait so she could be there for the next month. She doesn't have a lot of savings, but she wants to be there for you. I think the surprise was reflected on my face. And at that moment, Iona turned around and smiled at me. She froze when she realized what we were talking about, then smiled even wider when I smiled back and returned her attention to Colleen as we approached the penguins. Mel laughed. See? The ride home was almost as much fun as the descent, only a little more subdued. At one point, I spotted a tavern up ahead on the Waze map and called Damien to tell him that Jonah and I would be stopping for a while. Mel struck up a conversation telling us to have a good time and Damien, Colleen, and Mel thanked us for coming and spending the day with them. I was surprised that the conversation with Jonah was light and casual during our return trip, and as we parked and walked to the tavern. It was an early summer evening, dusk had been on for quite some time, and we took a seat by the window and perused the menu. We ordered drinks and food. I was going to indulge in a full portion of bourbon ribs, and Iona ordered the chicken pamageddon. For those wondering, that's Parmigiana, only scaled up with more cheese, chips, and gravy. I felt the mood turn serious for a moment. Thomas? came the question. I looked at her. I had already mentioned some of the general physical traits of this woman, who was now saving my life. But to elaborate, Iona was a native of Germany and had been raised in that country until she was four years old and her parents immigrated to Australia. She was a born lover of numbers and is now in graduate school interning in different parts of the country to see Australia before finding a place to settle down. Physically, Iona is quite small at just 5 feet 2 inches. 
I can guess what you and Mel have been talking about. I know you're going through a difficult situation, and you need a friend more than anything. She took a hesitant breath. That's what I want to be for you right now. A friend first and foremost. She paused for a moment and looked away, still holding my hands. But we've known each other for a while now, and over the last couple of weeks as we've gotten closer, I've realized it could be more than that. I think... No, I know. I like you more than a friend. Do you know what I'm talking about? I smiled. I was touched. This woman was letting me know that she was interested in more than just friendship, even knowing that there was nothing wrong with my head. Iona, I... I started to say, but stopped myself. Her face lowered, more like crushed, when I stopped. I think she thought it was a rejection. I squeezed her hands. Iona, you're an amazing woman and you're right. I need friends first and foremost right now. But to be honest with you, in the confusion I'm feeling right now, I kind of like you too. I left the rest of this without comment. More often than not, we go from happiness to despair in an instant and it's much easier to make your world crumble from under your feet than it is to climb up the mountain to the sunlight. But Jonah managed it. One moment I saw her thinking about rejection. The next moment there was an expression of serene joy on her face. Her smile was up to her ears and her big blue eyes looked at me with adoration. We spent the rest of the evening talking about likes and dislikes. We talked about movies, music, and of course Mustangs. I told her the story of losing my parents and grandparents, and her eyes widened when I confided in her about my trust fund. So why are you working at Samen and Zach's? She asked shortly after my story. I shrugged. I had originally planned to work there for a couple years just for the experience, I explained. I thought about working there for a while like you did to see different things, and I talked to my dad about starting an investment company in a few years, but when they died, I just stayed there. The mention of my parents' deaths in relation to my trust sobered us up a bit. Sorry, Thomas, when I look at you, I don't see some rich, spoiled guy. I see a man who is focused, but has no tolerance for fools, even if he has his own humility. I snorted. Thanks. I'm serious, you're a good man, she lectured me. You haven't lost your temper yet, and you haven't gone and killed them yet, referring to my wife and her lovers. No, not like they're going to do to me. I replied dejectedly without thinking. What? She said, widening her eyes. I realized what I'd said and proceeded to retell Jonah the high-level conversation my private investigator had picked up on. That they were all planning on blowing me off in a few years to get some of the money after I became the father of Candace's baby. Iona was shocked, and by the end of the conversation she was crying. You're doing something about this, aren't you? I'm not a lawyer, but this has to be a crime she almost whispered. Her fingers squeezed my hand. She was worried and I almost thought she was going to start looking for the killers. I nodded. Damien is on the case. It'll all happen at the end of next week. She let me go. I'm sorry, but Thomas, your wife is plotting to kill you, she said with an almost hysterical note in her voice. We talked for a few more minutes and as we walked back to my car, she held my hand, looking around almost constantly. It's okay, Iona, I said, holding her hand in mine. I doubt anyone is watching us, but if they are, I have a fast car and we can outrun them. That made her laugh, and the rest of the way home our conversation was much more subdued. When I dropped her off, Iona hugged me tightly, and in a moment of weakness I kissed her chastely on the lips. We both blushed and smiled, realizing what we had just done and realizing that there would be more to our relationship if we allowed it. As we drove away, I smiled. On the way to the new bed and breakfast I was staying at, I sang along to the radio and felt the ache in my heart begin to subside thanks to Damien, Mel, and Colleen, but mostly thanks to Jonah. I was already a couple streets away from home when the phone rang. It was Candace. I could hear her at the bar. Baby, she said with a note of concern in her voice, where are you? I've been trying to reach you all day. Damn, I thought, I haven't returned her call. Sorry, Candace but I went to Phillip Island today with some friends and their daughter to see the penguins. It was last minute and I got a little distracted. I felt the tension in her voice ease. Oh, okay, I was a little worried. Did you have a good day? She asked. Now the issue of my lack of communication was resolved. It was a great day. 
Seeing the penguins with the kids was amazing, I said, letting the genuine sense of joy I felt watching Colleen with the penguins flow through our conversation. They make you look at the happiness you experience in a different way. I wasn't lying. Watching Colleen with the penguins was hilarious. She loved feeding them the bait fish we bought, and at one point made us all laugh when a group of penguins followed her around looking for more food. You know, maybe we can start trying for a baby of our own when I get back. You're giving me nothing but trouble. That's right, I thought. Have a baby so you can poison me later. See you later, Candace. How's the conference going? Did you go? I asked, changing the subject. Oh yeah, the conference went great. We really did a lot of studying, she said, not realizing that I had picked up on the hint she was using. And yes, a group of us, including my boss, are going out for a few drinks. Don't worry, my boss is keeping an eye on me to make sure no outsiders trespass on my virtue. You bet, I thought, as if this whore had any virtue at all. After that, I lost interest in the conversation and let her talk to me for a few minutes about... Well, I have no idea what she was talking about. I wasn't listening anymore. She hung up with the words, I love you, but I don't know if she noticed that I never reciprocated. For the next week, I came to work early every day to get all the work done in time. Given what was coming up, I didn't want to leave any of my clients without work. I was sure that both Mary and William were up to something with George and Candace, but I didn't know what. And as the week went on, I noticed that they were looking at me less and less often as I turned up my nose. I moved to another hotel. Why? Well, against all odds, I was paranoid before I found out about the plot to end my life. After that, I was just as freaked out by the whole situation as Jonah was, so I switched locations every other day. I spent most evenings that week with Jonah. We would have dinner and she would help me pack up all of mine and Candace's things in my apartment. My stuff was going to the storage shed of the company I had invested in years ago and for free. Candace's stuff was being moved out and placed elsewhere with payment for 60 days, giving her a couple months to sort out her upcoming affairs. I talked to Candace every day and got Norm's reports. One night as we were packing up the kitchen, I mistakenly showed Jonah a couple of pictures from the report, and she immediately ran to the bathroom and threw up. When she came back, she was furious and kept hugging me, berating my soon-to-be ex-wife for her behavior. Monday morning came. It was game day. The cheaters were due back early in the morning, and I was going to be away for a month in Cairns in North Queensland. I went to work that morning like a normal day. I attended a staff meeting where William informed us that George would be back tomorrow. For the first time since I had been inducted, I noticed Mary looking at me while William was telling us this. I made a note to pass this on to Damien for conspiracy charges if they were involved in anything. Shortly before lunch, one of the group asked me if I wanted to have lunch with them, and I politely declined. However, when they left, I started in a race on my laptop and walked out, leaving my keys and cards on my desk. I wanted to leave a letter of resignation, but Damien's team was supposed to deliver it this afternoon. As I was leaving the office, the driver of the company car opened the door, greeting me. We drove to the airport and he informed me that our plane would be on time while Iona hugged me, giving me another of those chaste kisses I had grown to love. When we got to the airport, Damien and Mel were there to see us off. I handed my phone to the lawyer, and he in turn handed me a new phone with a new number on it. Only a few people knew this number, and it would remain that way for some time to come. Iona and I flew business class to Cairns, enjoying champagne as soon as we reached cruising level. I knew that Candace, as well as the other rogues, would be arriving home around this time. As we disembarked from the plane, we were met by another driver who took Jonah and I to the nice bed and breakfast we had booked for the first week of our stay. I'm partial to B&Bs, and I have to say this one was lovely. It was run by an elderly gay couple who had been together for 40 years. They built this split-level house when prices were cheap, and they had a house full of foster children. Now they ran a bed and breakfast for entertainment and company. They gave us a full breakfast in the morning with bacon, eggs, tomatoes, toast, beans, and spinach. The coffee was not as good as at home from a pod, but acceptable. But the view, the house had a gorgeous view of the water. At sunset, we loved watching the play of colors in the little cove as the waves gently lapped the walkway leading across the street to the esplanade. Jonah and Iona and I had a large double bed in our own attached bathroom with a double shower and whirlpool tub. The owners told us that they had remodeled a few years ago and now have two king bedrooms and four superior rooms. The king bedrooms were luxurious and cost a little more, but I knew it was worth it. On the way from the airport to the hotel, I turned on my phone and got a single text from Damien. 
It's done. Chaos ensued, but you're a free man. Now turn off your phone and I'll talk to you in a few days. I did as told, and that night after registering for the first time I got nervous. Jonah and I knew we were going to end up in the same bed, and I think we were worried because of our expectations of each other. Neither of us needed to worry. We went to the bedroom, and after that, we all fell asleep. Good morning, how are you feeling? She asked, noticing that I was awake. Awesome, last night was... Wow, seriously, Jonah, it was incredible. She squealed in praise. So it worked, she nodded approvingly. What worked? I asked, perplexed. You forgot about the bitch. And you claimed me as yours. And now I'm yours, Thomas. As long as you have me, my heart and soul are yours. We dressed and went to breakfast, walking slowly at first while Jonah got used to the slight soreness. Our hosts wished us good morning and gave us knowing looks. The next few days were amazing. Jonah and I enjoyed the cuisine. We visited the amazing Daintree Rainforest and even took a steam train and cable car ride. We snorkeled on a large barrier reef. By the end of the first week, I had forgotten my cell phone. It wasn't until Damien and Mel showed up with Colleen that I remembered it. We had agreed beforehand that for the second week, they would stay in the same place as us. Damien grinned and said that was fine. That night at dinner, he had a story to tell. Well, the scraps must have hit the rotating device, he said, when Colleen went to her room to watch a movie so the adults could talk. He leaned in. A total of nine people have been arrested in the last week on charges of conspiracy to commit murder. What? Jonah and I said at the same time. Damien grinned. Yes, he said, and a lawyerly grin spread across his face. From the statements we've been able to get on your behalf, and the interviews we've gotten from the police, over the last week five of the people you know, including your former boss and your soon-to-be ex-wife, the office manager at your former place of employment, the other owner, and two others at Candace's work have been involved. I leaned back in my chair and exhaled. Nine people wanted me dead, I asked. Sort of, Damien said. They all admitted to having nothing specific against you. Indeed, according to them, you were a very nice guy, but they had an agreement that each of them would receive at least a couple million dollars from your trust a few years after your death. Of course, they all blamed each other, well, except Candace. She broke down when she came home and found you gone, and the pictures and divorce papers say so. She is now being held in a secure wing of the local Ramsey Hospital for observation. I delivered your resignation letter and noticed that you are personally suing your former place of employment, he told me, smiling at the memory. Now they're closed for business and all employees are terminated immediately. Of course, no one thinks they'll survive. It's a similar situation at Candace's workplace. Oh, and I was also present when the notices were served and watched the arrest of Mr. Randwick Johnston. I have to say it was very satisfying from a professional standpoint. I wasn't charged for it. He winked at me and I laughed. What about Roger? I asked. He got arrested too. His wife thought he was traveling for work, not having fun with one of his friend's wives. I called her and asked if we could represent her pro bono. It seemed like the least I could do. Mel slapped Damien's face. Kid, stop teasing! We all laughed and spent the next hour prying for details. At one point, Mel looked at Jonah and I holding hands and commented. Well, that didn't take you two very long, did it? She stated. Iona just looked at me and blushed, then at Damien, and then Mel laughed. I made him take me in his arms the first night she told the couple in front of us. Then I made sure he never left the room. I don't think he had one free minute to think about those idiots. Besides, I think he likes it when I walk funny the next day. Damien exhaled his coffee through his nose and Mel laughed. I, on the other hand, just smiled like the Cheshire cat. Mel looked at me. I think you'll be fine, Thomas, she said, looking between Jonah and me. And this one, I know, is a keeper. They stayed with us for the next week and we enjoyed day trips around the world, overnight stays at casinos, and even a light airplane flight to the Daintree Coast. At the end of the week, they headed home to Melbourne, and we boarded a plane to Brisbane. In Brisbane, Iona introduced me to her parents as her boyfriend, and I happily played the part. Back in a major metropolitan city, we were on the news one night where they were talking about a plot to destroy the future. My name wasn't mentioned, but when Jonah told my parents it was me, they almost panicked until we told them the story. 
more honest and trustworthy people I had never met as we went through our journey with them. We spent another week sightseeing in Brisbane and then another week in Sydney. By the time a month had passed, neither Jonah nor I could imagine ourselves without each other. Toward the end of the trip, we started talking about marriage and children. I told her that once I was divorced, we would get engaged. It wasn't a traditional proposal, but she loved me anyway, knowing that when the time came, I would get down on one knee in front of her. When the subject of children came up, she blushed. Thomas, I have a confession to make, she said. I might be pregnant, she said shyly, trying to gauge my reaction. She sighed. I'm supposed to get my period in a few days, and then we'll all know. She looked at me hopefully again. Are you crazy? I snorted. No, I've thought about it a few times, I admitted. Honestly, I was hoping we'd accidentally get pregnant. For the past month, I can't think of anyone I'd rather have a baby with than you. Unfortunately, she woke up in the morning with her period. I kissed her with an unhappy look and told her maybe next month. In the meantime, we need to practice a lot. Eventually, we finished our vacation and headed back to Melbourne. We stayed overnight at Iona's house. She managed to persuade the landlord to keep her apartment for a few more months instead of going north. It was a small apartment a half hour outside of town. After staying at all the bed and breakfasts around the country for the past month, Iona was a little embarrassed about her accommodations. I shooed her away and spent the next half hour walking around the apartment, asking the most inane questions about everything in the world. By the end of it, she was already giggling and coming up with ostentatious answers. The next day, we went to Damien's office. Jonah and I worked there looking at new places to live. During lunch, Mel brought us both coffee. Mel, what are you doing here? Iona asked. Asked Iona. Asked Iona. A little birdie told me you were here, so I thought I'd come by to see how you were doing and bring you some coffee. Freshly made, of course. She set them on the table and took a sip of her coffee when Iona sighed. What's wrong, Iona? Asked Mel catching the concern in her sigh. Iona shrugged her shoulders. It's not all that good, Mel. He hasn't knocked me up yet. A few moments later, Mel was already splashing coffee on the conference room table. Excuse me? I laughed. Jonah and I are going to try to have a baby. After the past month, we just decided to see what happens. That's quick, Mel said, perhaps a little concerned. We both nodded to our friend. Maybe. Iona said dismissively. There's no one in this world I'd rather have a baby with, she said, looking at me adoringly. Mel looked between us, studying us with her gaze, and suddenly shrugged. Then she asked what we were doing at the office. As soon as she found out we were looking for a house, she immediately agreed. She spent the next couple hours working with us, helping us determine our wants and needs, where we would live, and what we might need if we were going to have a baby. At one point, Damien stopped by on his way to court and smiled at me as he heard the two women talking in the kitchen. Over the next month, we looked at several places and eventually settled on three apartments and a house. Iona relented, saying it was my money and she would be happy to have me by her side. I replied that it would be our place and we would choose it together. We ended up choosing a penthouse apartment in a slightly older building at the bottom of Collins Street. It was fairly easy to get to major highways from here. Public transportation was fast, and like everywhere else in Melbourne, it was a short walk to any food. The apartment itself was gorgeous. It had three modest bedrooms and a large master bedroom. It had a great view of Melbourne Park, where the tennis matches and the Australian Open were held. The building had a pool, sauna and gym, and a 24-hour concierge. We had two garage spaces and I was able to park my Mustang and the new Jeep that Ioni bought. All in all, it was like an enlarged hotel that we could call home. There wasn't much furniture in the house, but it was worth spending an afternoon with Mel, and everything changed. Within a month, we had moved in, which was a good thing since Jonah's period never came that month. Now it's been almost nine months since it started. Jonah is now six months old, and we have our baby boy. We've settled into the apartment, and it seems like every surface has soft baby-proofing on it. We've turned one of the rooms into a nursery, another into a bedroom for guests, and a third into an office for work. As for work... Jonah and I have started a new investment business. At the moment, we only have a couple million, as I'm still a couple years away from getting a trust. But Iona is good with numbers, and she has a good head on her shoulders. She owns 10% of the stock in the new venture. She said she didn't want anything, but I managed to convince Mel. 
To be honest, that's the only fight we've had so far. I now own 70%. We have an investor with 15%, and the last 5% is owned by Damien and Mel. They have become very close friends, and it never ceases to amaze me the difference between Damien the lawyer and Damien the friend. As a lawyer on my side, he was such a force that you had to get out of his way or be destroyed. He managed to get judgments against Candace's and my former places of employment. Both companies were now in administration, but they had a lot of liquid assets when everything happened, so he said, both Jonah and I would receive substantial amounts in checks. He also secured a win for Roger's wife, where almost all of the assets went to her, as he was now in prison for the next 30 years, as were almost everyone else involved in the plot to kill me. I received one message from William and George asking for mercy, which I immediately tore up in front of Damien when he showed me the pearly whites. And finally, he took great pleasure in cutting my former lawyer to pieces on the stand during the trial. I hadn't mentioned Candace too much so far, but not because she was getting away with it. In fact, she got 35 years without parole. The only people in court who sympathized with her when her sentence was announced were her parents. However, after learning what she had done and what she planned to do, I don't think their support was much even then. The judge immediately granted a divorce based on the offenses against me. He noted his disgust at their behavior and the fact that they had ruined so many lives. According to the prenuptial agreement, Candace left with her belongings and $15,000 to start her life over. I put that money in a trust fund with a percentage of the income she would receive upon her release from prison. Due to her mental illness, she did not attend the court hearing. She was still in the secure psychiatric unit and was to be transferred to the medical unit of a medium security prison within a month of sentencing. Her only request was that I come to visit her once she was settled. I agreed, citing that it would not interfere with the divorce. Six weeks later, I was sitting in a secure meeting room in the medical wing of the prison where Candace was being held. The room was simple. A bolted table, chairs with chains, one of those one-way mirrors they always show in movies. I'd been sitting there for about 10 minutes when the doctor and the guard brought my ex-wife in. She looked like six kinds of hell. Her normally straight brown hair was loose all over. It looked like she had tried to comb it in some places, but not others. Next were the eyes. They were shifting to the sides as if she was looking for something. It didn't look like she was threatened by anything, but it looked like she was looking for a threat. When she saw me, it was as if she focused and an eerie calm came over her. The doctor frowned but retreated to a corner. The third and most obvious thing was that my ex-wife was very, very pregnant. I looked at her belly as she sat up and Candace smiled. I'm actually almost a week late, Thomas, she told me, running her hands over her swollen belly. They told me that if I don't go into labor within 24 hours, they're going to have to induce labor for me. Is that normal, Thomas? Our baby, Candace? I caught the doctor's wave and stopped. It's okay, Candace, I told her. Have them paid you so you can have the baby. She seemed to relax. Thomas, I want you to know that I never wanted to see you dead. I didn't care about your money. But they all convinced me, Candace told me sadly. They told me that after we had the baby, it would be the right time. I didn't want to do anything to you, but they said that if I didn't do it, they would do it anyway. But it would be much more cruel, and I would be left with nothing. Thomas, my love, you have to believe me. She stopped and waited. I looked at the doctor and he shrugged. Candace, I started to say. It's okay, Thomas, she said, interrupting me and smiled sadly, looking into my eyes for a moment before looking away again. I know we're divorced. I realize that, but when our baby is born, I'm sure they'll let me out and I'll make things right. All those things I did, honey, they meant nothing to me. You should know that I love only you. When Roger took me the first time, I felt so guilty, Candace said in a whisper, as if it were a secret. But when George found out, and then my job, them, Randy? Thomas. She raised her pleading eyes to me again. Can you forgive me? I paused. Candace? She started again, interrupting me. It's okay, Thomas. Our baby will help you forgive me. We have this baby and I will come out, then we can be a family. I promise I won't let them kill you again. She began to ramble incoherently. I love you, Thomas. You're my number one boyfriend. All of them are number two. I mean, they were good, but they were just as interested in each other as they were in me. 
I think they only had fun with me for the money. Thomas, it's just going to be you and me here, and of course our baby. For the next 15 minutes, she rambled on about our baby, about us being together again, about her coming out and us being a family. At one point, she stopped and the doctor and I looked at each other, and then we heard a sob. I know I screwed up, Thomas, she said quietly, a note of sanity and reservation in her voice that hadn't been there before. I know this baby isn't yours, and you and I will never. She shuddered with sobs. The drugs they give me calm me down, make me think it's possible. But in between their effects and when they're weathered, I have moments where I remember what a slut I was. She looked at me, tears streaming down her face. Her eyes reflected the pain in her eyes. I betrayed everyone. I became a whore out of greed when you offered me all of this anyway. I betrayed you often, and then I was going to poison you. I'm a low, dirty whore who deserves revenge. She was beginning to worry. I know you hate me, Thomas, and I am cursed for still loving you as much as the day I betrayed you. She stood up and in one motion pulled off her prison top and maternity bra, leaving her topless. The doctor tried to cautiously approach her. Candace grabbed her stomach. Get back at Thomas, she growled, addressing herself rather than me. Hit me and make me cry, hurt me and make me feel the pain you feel. This baby is not yours. I gave this body away when it didn't belong to me. She collapsed to the ground and sobbed. I didn't know what to do and just sat next to her. It was supposed to be yours, Thomas. It was supposed to, she repeated, sitting on the ground. Slowly, Candace looked at me and then at the doctor. The doctor, sensing that things were coming to an end, gently turned to my ex-wife. I think it's time for us to eat dinner and for you to take your next round of medication, don't you, Candace? The doctor helped her into her outer garments, and as she knocked on the door and the guard outside took her away, Candace took one last look at me, a sad smile on her face. Live well, Thomas. And with that, she left. A week later, I got a call from her doctor thanking me for seeing her. She told me that everything had gone better than he expected, and Candace had given birth to a baby girl. The baby was healthy, and DNA testing was now being done on the father. Candace advised them to put the baby up for adoption so that the girl would grow up in a loving family, rather than going through the foster care system in hopes of one day being close to her, which she knew would not happen. That night after meeting Candace, I was all out of breath until Jonah laid my head on her stomach and I felt our son kicking. Two months later, John Thomas the other was born. I thought of the innocent little girl, and in a moment of weakness, I asked Damien to contact the adoption agency and inquire about the possibility of adopting baby Candace. Two more months passed and little Macy Candace Drew moved in with us. We learned that she was Randy's child, and Damien happily sued the disgraced attorney for child support again. In the end, a paltry sum was allocated to her university fund. Of course, she would never need them, but it was a basic sum. Jonah, for her part, never treated Candace's daughter any differently than she treated her own children. We both believed that a child should not suffer the sins of their biological parents. Jonah and I married a year later, when the kids were walking, and then on our honeymoon, we gave them a baby sister. A year and a half later, a baby brother came along, and then Iona convinced me to have surgery. When Macy turned 18, we told her the truth about her origins, about our history with her birth parents, and that no matter what, we loved her. There were turbulent emotions in the apartment that week, and only talking to Aunt Mel calmed her down and made her realize that Jonah and I would always be her parents. Anyway, we made an appointment for her to meet Randy and Candace. Randy didn't care at all, but he insulted her as a mistake that shouldn't have been born, then tried to insult her as a tainted product that landed him in jail. This caused two guards to pull me away from my former attorney, put him in the infirmary for a week, and robbed him of three of his teeth. Macy never saw him again. Candace, on the other hand, was a different story. She had recovered enough over the years to be released to the general ward. She was still frail, but the doctors told us that several inmates kept an eye on her and kept her out of too much trouble. When Candace saw Macy standing there with Jonah and me, she realized everything and broke down, kneeling in the visitor's lounge, covering her mouth with her hand and sobbing. Macy, being a well-mannered young woman, walked over to her and helped her up, then walked with her to the table. Jonah and I stood back and watched as Macy, holding out her hand, said to Candace, Hi, my name is Macy Candace Other, and my mom and dad told me that you are my birth mother.
we watched Candace burst into tears again. The guards were watching us, but we had warned them ahead of time that this was going to happen, and the warden allowed some hugging, but only after Candace had gone through a full body search. I have to admit that even I was moved by the scene with my adopted daughter and ex-wife standing in front of me. Jonah looked up at me and wiped away a tear, exclaiming that it must be pollen. A minute later, my wife pulled me over to my ex-wife and we spent the next hour talking. Candace thanked me for adopting Macy. She had no idea what happened to her after she gave her up and didn't even know her name. The fact that I adopted her daughter changed Candace for the better, and the doctors told us that her behavior improved markedly after that. She still had a little less than half her sentence left to serve, but the prison told us that she had become a much more model prisoner since that encounter. For her part, Macy visited Candace on her birthday and at Christmas. They were never very close, but at the insistence of her mother and Aunt Mel, she traveled to see her. For my part, I grudgingly agreed. I had already begun to forgive her, but Candace knew as well as I did that we would never be friends. As far as Jonah and I were concerned, she was still the woman who made my soul sing. She once took the risk of letting me know that I was being held for a fool. She guards me jealously and is friendly to anyone, but if she sees anyone making moves toward me, she scolds him in German. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed it, so subscribe to my channel and watch the next video.